Good evening and welcome to the, the last talk before the break. Even though there seems to be considerable debate in the media about this whole climate change thing, in fact, there's a very strong consensus within the scientific community that global warming is happening and is being caused by human activity. Virtually every National Academy of Science in every country of the world, every scientific society that's looked at climate change, 98% of peer-reviewed scientific papers, they're all on side with this. And what basically they're saying is that if you look back over the past, say, 1,000 years and look at temperature, average temperature of the planet, around the year 1800 started the Industrial Revolution when we began burning fossil fuels, coal, oil, gas, the average temperature of the planet started to increase. And to this point in time, it's gone up roughly three quarters of one degree Celsius. And that corresponds very closely with the increase in the concentration of carbon dioxide within the Earth's atmosphere. And carbon dioxide is greenhouse gas that traps heat and makes the atmosphere get warmer. So to this point in time, we're looking at a concentration of carbon dioxide that's in the order of 390 parts per million. That's the highest it's been in the past 800,000 years. But what's a real concern to scientists is that over the next 35 years, the year 2050, that concentration is likely to exceed 600 parts per million. So that's gonna have a further driving increase on average temperature. Now at this point, I'd like to mention that there's a, a strong scientific consensus that this is happening, but at the same time, there's voices out there, there's lobby groups, there's big oil money that would like to cast some doubt on these findings because they have a vested financial interest in keeping things as they are, but at the end of the day, they'll suffer the same consequences. So what are the consequences? Like how, how bad would it be if the Earth were a few degrees warmer? Let's take a look at that. Nine of the 10 hottest years in record have all happened within the last 10 years. And I should mention that the instrumental record for temperature started around 1880. So one obvious consequence of that is we're seeing more and more extreme heat waves. This city in Pakistan, 2010, the temperature hit 54 degrees Celsius, 129 degrees Fahrenheit, highest temperature ever recorded in an Asian city. People die when it gets that hot. Last summer in North America, over 5,000 all-time daily heat records were broken, making it the hottest summer on record. Another consequence of climate change is we're seeing an increase in the number of really big tropical storms and hurricanes and tornadoes, category three, four, five. And the reason for this is the warmer air can accommodate more moisture from the oceans and the warmer oceans speed up the velocity of these storms. Last summer in Beijing, in one day, they had a rainfall of 170 millimeters. It killed 77 people, their biggest rainfall in 60 years. End of October, last year, Superstorm Sandy put much of New York City underwater. In January 2011, much of the east coast of Australia was flooded, which essentially covered an area larger than the entire nations of France and Germany combined. And in our own country, May of 2011, in the Lac Saguenay uh, Richelieu area, 2,600 homes were underwater. And indeed, it's happening everywhere in our country. So it's happening east coast, west coast, central, northern. And the number one insurance claim in Canada is storm-related flooding. Moving now to the glaciers of the world, this is a photograph of Helm Glacier in Garibaldi Provincial Park, British Columbia, taken in 1929. And there's the photograph of the same glacier taken 2002. So that glacier has receded over 2,000 meters over that period of time. And, and where this becomes a real concern is that many of the big cities of the world, this being one example, La Paz, Bolivia, depend on glaciers for their drinking water and their agriculture. So there's gonna be great hardship if that water supply is in any way reduced. At the same time as the warmer air is drawing more moisture out of the oceans to create these bigger storms, it's also sucking water out of the, those parts of the world that are already very dry to begin with. So we're gonna see more and more extreme drought. In 2010 in Yunnan province, over 16 million people, 11 million livestock faced 
severe drinking water shortages. These drier conditions are also causing an overall increase in the number of forest fires. British Columbia, the Vinta Lake region, over 100,000 acres were destroyed. Considering other species of the planet, the, the province of Manitoba has declared the polar bear to be an endangered species. They're, they're losing their habitat. There's just no place for them to go. And scientists are predicting we could lose as many as 50% of all species on planet Earth. And let's be clear, when you look in the mirror in the morning, we humans are also on that endangered species list. Regardless of your religious persuasion, I believe it's very much a moral issue. What right do we as a species have to consume the resources of the planet such that other species can't survive, but also what right do we as a generation have to consume resources such that our kids and their kids and other future generations can enjoy the same wonderful world that we have. Turning now to the polar regions of the world, this is a composite satellite photograph taken of the North Pole in September 1981. And here's a composite satellite photograph taken in September 2007. So the summer ice has decreased by 40% over that period of time, and scientists are predicting we may in fact have no ice at the North Pole during the summertime within the next 30 years. When land-based ice melts, and that would include, for example, the country of Greenland or the continent of Antarctica, it's gonna cause an overall increase in sea level and since so many of the world's population choose to live in coastal areas, they will be displaced. So in, in summary then, the consequences of climate change look to be fairly serious. We can expect increases in heat waves, forest fires, severe storms and flooding, drought, water shortages, species extinction, and displaced population from sea level rise. So not a, not a pretty picture. What we are witnessing is a collision between our human civilization and planet Earth. And there, there are three contributing factors that I'd like to draw your attention to. They are, number one, the human population explosion, number two, the scientific and technological revolution, and number three, simply our way of thinking. So we're gonna look at each of these in turn. And starting with the, the population explosion, as best we know, our human species originated in Central Africa roughly 160,000 years ago and then migrated to various parts of the world. Now here's the thing, it took 10,000 generations of humans to get from that point of inception to the population at the end of the Second World War, which was roughly 2.3 billion, but it's taken only one generation to get from that point to the population of the world today, 7 billion, a threefold increase. And the trend now is we're looking at a worldwide population in the order of 9.2 billion by the year 2050. Now, if there's some good news there, it's that the 9.2 billion is likely to be a fairly stable figure going forward because as, as general affluence levels improve, families are choosing to have fewer children. Women are choosing to have fewer children. But the dilemma and the challenge is that with the internet and the television, everybody in the world now knows how we live in, in Canada, in the Western world, everybody wants that lifestyle. And the problem is, of course, we would need five planet Earths for everybody on the planet to have the resources to live as we do. The, the second contributing factor is the, the scientific and technological revolution. Absolutely, there's been amazing and wonderful positive advances in science and technology. Medicine, telecommunications, computers, a lot of good things. But what you have to realize is that old habits plus new technology can often yield dramatically altered consequences. To give you an example, we used to dig holes in the ground with a manual instrument that we call a shovel. Well, that's not a shovel. That's a shovel. We can now transform the planet in ways that were never previously possible without fully understanding the consequences. That's actually a diamond mine close to Siberia. But don't get me wrong, because technology is very much part of the solution to climate change. We do indeed have a number of uh, solutions at hand, and I'd like to give you some examples of those. 
So, so looking in the, in the realm of renewable energy, this is an example of a solar thermal electricity generation plant in California. So essentially you've got large collector mirrors on the ground which track the sun and then they focus the sunlight on a collector pipe along the middle with a fluid, gets very, very hot, and then that's used in turn to boil water, to generate steam, to turn the turbine to create the electricity. There's a slightly different model of the same concept, solar thermal, where we have a collector tower where the mirrors on the ground focus the sunlight to a point at the top of the tower, but again, it's used to, to generate steam, to turn the turbine, to create the electricity. Solar thermal can also be used on a smaller scale. Each of these townhomes in Germany has a solar thermal panel, which provides their heating and hot water needs. Uh, another form of renewable energy is solar voltaic, solar cells. This is the Pope Paul VI audience hall in Vatican City. There are 2,400 panels meeting all of the electricity needs of that conference center. And it can even be done on a very small scale. So each of these laptop computers in Sierra Leone is being powered by a flexible solar panel. Another form of renewable energy is our wind, wind turbines, which can share space with agriculture or other purposes. In Canada, we have over 100 large-scale wind farms. This is in, on Wolf Island, just off the, uh, the coast of Kingston. There are 86 turbines meeting the electricity needs of 75,000 homes. Wind turbines can also be constructed at a much larger scale offshore. Shanghai is an example where they're less likely to disrupt human activities, and of course they can be built that much larger. Another form of renewable energy is geothermal. So here what we do is we take a liquid and we pump it deep beneath the surface of the earth, say three or four kilometers, it gets very, very hot there, heat up that liquid and bring it back to the surface to generate the steam to turn the turbine. A year ago, we had an opportunity to visit the country of Iceland, which is just a great place. I would highly, highly recommend it. Most of their electricity is created through geothermal and they have enough hot water left over to heat their entire uh, capital city of Reykjavik and to have all these recreational spots. So really neat place to go. Geothermal can also be done at a smaller scale. This is a condo project in Victoria, British Columbia, where by simply going down one to 200 meters, you can then bring up uh, the liquid which will keep uh, baseline heating and cooling within your residential facility. So the storyline with this little sequence of slides essentially is that clearly to generate any kind of electricity, there will be some carbon emissions associated, some carbon dioxide footprint. Much of the electricity in North America to this point has been generated by burning coal and gas. And as you can see from this chart, it has quite a large CO2 footprint. But when we move to renewables, and be they solar or wind or geothermal or hydro, they have a much, much lower carbon emissions footprint. And these numbers actually represent total life cycle cost of these various means of generating electricity. Another exciting development is the increase in the number of hybrid and all plug-in electric cars. Over 30 models now available in Canada. Indeed, plug-in cars will be a means of storing renewable energy as the batteries are being charged at night when the wind is blowing. If you travel across Europe, if you travel in Japan, uh, electric trains are a very popular, fast, convenient, quiet means of transport. And ideally with an Ottawa, within a couple of years, we'll have our own electric light rail transit system. So by way of mini summary of this section, clearly if we continue business as usual, then obviously our emissions will continue to grow. This is actually a timeline from 1970 to 2050 where the emissions go up. There is no silver bullet to this problem, but there is what I would call silver buckshot. Like there's just a whole range of things we could be doing that make a lot of sense to do anyway. So for example, if we improve our end use efficiency, electrical and otherwise, if we improve our tra uh, passenger vehicle efficiency and other means of transport efficiency, and if we implement these various forms of renewable energy, certainly there's the possibility that our total emissions would be at a point below where they were in 1970. But to make that happen, what you need are the right policies and frameworks 
to encourage renewable energy development and to discourage artificial subsidies currently in the order of billions of dollars on fossil fuels. And effectively, we need to place a true cost on, on carbon emissions. A very important crossover year, 2010, for the first time saw the total worldwide investment in renewable projects exceed the total worldwide investment in fossil fuel energy projects. So this transition is occurring, is a good thing, it just needs to happen more quickly. The third contributing factor has simply been our way of thinking. We've, we've tended to look at the world using an older corporate model where we have this big honking thing called the economy and little bubbles on the side that we call the environment and society. And of course, that's, that's not really the correct, correct picture. What we need is to have nature's perspective. We cannot have an economy without a society and a healthy environment. So as we start to wrap this up, we've touched on three things this evening. Number one, Climate change is real and is being caused by human activity. Number two, we can see the consequences of today and what's likely to happen in the near future. And number three, there's a whole range of solutions that would greatly help the situation, make sense to do anyway. So in closing, this is what's at stake. We, we are at a crossroads. We have to accept the reality of climate change. And at the end of the day, we have one of two choices. We can either sit idly by and accept the consequences, or we can say, no, this is wrong, I want to be part of the solution. It is possible to live sustainably on planet Earth and preserve our human civilization. And what we collectively decide now will determine that future forever. Thank you.